technology for me this anyway. Here we go. So as I said, Michael House will introduce you, so I'll be very brief. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff, for reading from your own work. The first poem I'll read is called Fall of a Greek City, and it's from a theme of E.M. Root. This was a poem that I read about the triumph of, of, of a Greek runner uh, from the ancient world. But in fact, I thought there was another way of looking at it, uh, which you'll hear uh, when I read the poem, which is in the form of Villeneuve, Fall of a Greek City, running and running through the dust and heat. The city waits in silence for this man, a speck of light moving on silent feet. The lines began to crumble and retreat. Swords flashed. He watched and noted and began, running and running through the dust and heat. Through granite passes where harsh sunlight beat and water dripped in shade, with pain he ran a speck of light moving on silent feet. How long he trained to make his limbs complete, these bitter honours never in the plan, running and running through the dust and heat. The city waits for what he will repeat. Mothers will mourn tonight in every clan, a speck of light moving on silent feet. To fall down on his knees and gasp defeat. He knows that he must do this and he can, running and running through the dust and heat, a speck of light moving on silent feet. The next poem I'll read was written many years later, by which time I was 62, and that's quite a long time ago now as I'm now 79. It's called Self Portrait at 62, and it's basically about being a prostate cancer survivor. So that's a long time ago. Age 62, I like what I do. Minus a prostate, I have erectile dysfunction. But we make love in our way and still with fervor within my altered body map. I lunch outdoors at a Buddhist restaurant with three of my children between the white pendulous flowers of a datura and a giant ginger plant, Lucy, to show she's in recovery, closes her eyes and touches the tip of her nose with her index finger. Her elder brother does the same. They laugh and explain. If you have MS, you're okay if your finger can locate your nose. It changes your consciousness, he says at another lunch eating gado gado with chopsticks. And sometimes you remember a time before MS. Age 62, I like what I do and remember an earlier body map. A young person has left a message on my voicemail. I have an insoluble problem, she says, with untaxed profits in a unit trust. And if you could call me, I'd be oh so grateful. A young person has donated the body I inhabit. Its tit shins tend to flake, so I rub in a white medicinal cream. It makes the skin supple and smooth and pleasantly fragrant. My body sits in an office tower, one of a pair. The twin towers overlook a geometrical garden with a family of three bronze wombats through which I walk to lunch at the Buddhist restaurant. The eyes of my body peer at a screen, a diagram of 40 or so companies connected by colored arrows and dotted lines. My fountain pen leaves red ticks on a sheet. Where the companies are sorted by a class, then stops at a name I can't classify. I am married to beautiful, argumentative you. You say, when I'm talking about me, how do you always change the subject to you? I'm completing a survey for prostate cancer survivors. Do you have feelings of worthlessness? I circle never. 
do you feel positive? I circle always. My son Harry, six foot one, has a gentle manner. We drive in each morning, have coffee in the travertine foyer of the Twin Towers, and he walks to school. He dismisses the applied sciences at some traffic lights. I brace myself, unsure where this leads. Electron clouds interest me. Air pollution doesn't. Now we come to the day of this self-portrait. An ordinary day when no one dies or falls in love. Age 62, a few days south of 63. I forget to say goodbye to the dog. Your job is to make his breakfast. My job is to play. Sometimes I lie on the grass, my hands shielding my face from his tongue. After squeezing orange juices for three, my 16 year old and I are strapping ourselves in. The garage door rolls up. We drive through refrigerated stillness, early to beat the traffic, not for the poetry of empty streets, blue mornings and a white winter sun. He abstains from catching the train with friends, perhaps because he's my youngest, Estremo Unico Fior. But for my child, I hope the cold earth is a distant prospect. I order two cappuccinos in the travertine foyer. He's your son, they ask. My fifth and last child. He must be spoilt. Not so, I say inwardly. He's the last of siblings who've grown up and left, ignoring his, hey, wait for me. I unlock the glass door of my office and am hemmed in by pale wooden papers. My window doesn't look out on the geometrical garden. Switching on my computer, I look down at three freeways, some hotels, a construction site for a cross city tunnel, as mechanical shovels empty earth into waiting trucks. The cars are army ants that don't stop until one detaches from the flow and hesitates where a freeway splits in two. Indicator flashing, it creeps across a white hatched dividing strip, locates the missed route and speeds up. I answer phone calls and emails. Eight levels above the construction site, I hear a jackhammer faintly tapping, almost inaudible through plate glass. Mid-morning, there's a panic. By tonight, I am to write a 15-page opinion on a fictional game that would stop a large transaction. I assemble my thoughts. I look across a slowly moving cloudscape, university towers on the rim of our planet, aircraft tilted upwards, gaining height. I search my hard drive for text that I can paste. After two hours, I have little to show, a few unimpressive sentences. So I lunch by myself in a deli, antipasto and salad leaves. Mid-afternoon, my edifice of words is taking shape on screen. My opinion balances hope and risk, and with a flip of logic, eliminates doubt. Below my window, a screw drill suspended from a crane withdraws from the hole it has bored, swings free with a reverse twist, cascading dirt. I hardly notice as the day declines, the flashing orange lights of mechanical shovels moving about in compacted mud, the cold earth, an approaching prospect. I'm absorbed in formatting the analysis of facts, the cadences of reassurance. The pages compose themselves on my screen. The cursor lifts and rearranges texts. At twilight, land and sky are a pool of luminous indigo violet, my office and image brightly lit, suspended on the glass, the red taillights of the army ants head west. I speak to you on the phone. After 23 years, your voice still thrills me, of Aphrodite or Pallas Athene or both. Outside it's gone black. There's no construction site, just a void. As my two fingers tap into the night, the people who are waiting for my opinion are going home. Finally, I type, yours sincerely, my name, tax council. It's marked, draft, more refinements are needed, and I push 
the send button. There's a distant alarm. I consider the fire stair while, while I wait. The lift arrives, crossing the deserted travertine foyer. I pass abandoned coffee machines. The alarm is ringing loudly, intensely. Someone must have breached a security door. In the car park, my ignition key starts the motor and sound system, Pandolfo Mialli's La Stella. There's a fire engine outside the building, its lights blinking lazily, red, white, and blue. I swing across oncoming headlights, head up a lane, turn left for home. Poetry is incidental. I am my poem. Jeff Lehman, thank you very much indeed.